Thank you very much. So uh, I want to thank the, the organizers particularly because that's a slightly exotic uh, topic for a, for a conference on, on Riemannian uh, geometry, but at least it says beyond Riemann, so I, I, I take the liberty of, of considering Lorentzian as beyond Riemann, and it's, it's about synthetic geometry, so, so I hope it, it is of, of some interest to the community here. So, um, so first, what, what's the motivation to look at, at synthetic uh, Lorentzian geometry? So um, a main uh, motivation for, for, this, for this entire branch of research comes from general relativity uh, because um, a lot of, of, of concrete models in, in relativity um, are automatically of, of low regularity in the metric. So for example, when you think of the gravitational field of a star, then you automatically have, uh, or the, 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 the mass density of a star, then you automatically have a jump. And so um, you, you cannot expect your, your space-time metric automatically to be at least C2. And when you go below C2, then uh, more and more uh, tools from, from, from Lorentzian geometry become unavailable. And one still, of course, wants a, wants a good description of such models. Um, another motivation is, just like in, in, in metric geometry, to, to separate main concept from derived notions, in particular also uh, with a view to, to causality theory. So you want a kind of minimal framework for, for causality theory, where you can talk about time-like and causal curves and certain properties that, that the space-time can have uh, in, the, in the sense of causality. So, uh, and you want uh, a synthetic formulation of curvature bounds. So, but now, since you have to take uh, into account the causal character of, of the curves you, you are looking at, you will be interested in time-like or causal curvature bounds. And of course, in, in, in the back of one's mind, one can also have potential applications to, to that go beyond, for example, general relativity, like quantum gravity, and there are indeed uh, certain, um, certain fields that are explored uh, that have close ties also to, to the synthetic uh, approach to Lorentzian geometry, for example, causal set theory, and also, also, also causal fermion systems. Um, so, the regularity class, if you, if you want to look at it like analytically, the regularity class where everything is still fine, basically, uh, of the metric is C11. So C1 metric where the, where the derivatives are still uh, Lipschitz, because in that case you still have unique solutions of the geodesic equations. And also you, your curvature quantities, they are uh, second derivatives and uh, are L infinity, so you still have bounded curvature. But below that, all bets are off and things can happen. So here is a, a, a motivation for, for um, the, the synthetic sectional curvature definitions I, I will show you later on. So there is, of course, the, the well-known theorem of Toponogov for, for Riemannian manifolds, where you can characterize sectional curvature bounds by a triangle comparison. So you, you form... Uh, small geodesic triangles, and then you check a corresponding points, uh, the distance of corresponding points, and you compare it with distances in one of the, of the model spaces of, of constant curvature, and that really is a characterization of curvature bounds, so this is really equivalent. And you can do a similar thing in, in general semi-Riemannian manifolds uh, if, you, if you are careful about what you mean by a sectional curvature bound. So you, you have to, dis, so to distinguish uh, space-like planes and, and time-like planes, and you, you want different uh, by, um, signs in the, in the bounds here. And then it was comparatively late, it was done by Alexander and Bishop in 2008, who showed uh, a Toponogov theorem for, for general semi-Riemannian manifolds characterizing sectional curvature bounds in this sense by triangle comparison where you now use sign distances. So you take care of uh, what, what, is the, what is the sign of, the, of, of G of V comma V where V is the tangent vector of, of the geodesic you're using. 
So uh, let, me, let me very briefly recall uh, Lorentzian uh, causality theory. So if mg is a Lorentzian manifold uh, and g is a Lorentzian metric, which I here will always assume to have this signature, so minus and then plus, and then uh, you can distinguish for, for tangent vectors, they are time-like if the product with themselves is less than zero, null if it's equal to zero and, and the vector is non-zero, causal if it's less or equal zero, and V is, is different from zero and greater than zero that you call space-like. And of course, this has uh, immediate meaning in the, in the uh, applications in, in relativity, for example. So these would be uh, so curves with time-like um, tangent vector, they, they are subluminal in speed and null would be light, basically. And you can do that for curves of, of sufficient regularity and then you can also write down the length of a curve, just like in the Riemannian setting, you just have some absolute value here. Okay, so a little bit about uh, causality theory. So um, mg is a space-time by, by which uh, we mean a Lorentzian manifold which is time-oriented, so there exists a a global time-like vector field, and then you say that the vector is future-directed if the scalar product with that uh, vector field T uh, is less than zero, and you have uh, causal relations. So we write P less less Q if there exists a future-directed, in this sense, time-like curve from P to Q, and less equal if there exists a future-directed causal curve from P to Q or P equals Q. And then you can look at the time separation function and that will be a main object so that will actually go in, into the axiomatization of, of, of Lorentzian geometry in this approach. Um, the time separation function between two points, if they are causally re related, is the supremum of the lengths of all causal curves connecting them. And an interesting fact to keep in mind is that this is a classical result of Hawking, King, and McCarthy that under mild assumptions, this actually completely determines the metric. So if you, if you have uh, <coughs> two Lorentzian manifolds and, uh, and you have, uh, well, yeah, if, if you have a Lorentzian manifold with, with, if you have two metrics and they have the same tor and they have some mild causality restriction, then actually they must be isometric. No, it's milder than that, but, but it goes in that direction. So, so, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. So yeah, you need something like strongly causal, which means you have, so causal would be no closed time like curves, and strongly causal is between that and globally hyperbolic. But of, yeah, <clears throat> okay. Um, so here's, here's the first uh, um, step into, into a synthetic version of, of this. This basically goes back to Kron Kronheimer and Penrose in 67. Uh, you take a, a set with two relations and you call it a causal space. So you have less equal is a pre-order and less less is a transitive uh, relation contained in this less equal. Of course, what you think about is this time-like relation and the causal relation uh, I showed you before. And um, at the moment you do not automatically assume causality conditions like globally hyperbolic or something like that. And then uh, you define, well, you say two points in, in, in your space, x is less than y if, if and only if x is less equal but different. And then you can define um, the, the chronological future. And so the chronological future are all points that, all points z that have x is less less z, meaning they lie. If if you think about the the space time setting, then these are this is precisely the the chronological future of the point. So all all points that you could reach by a curve, but of course in this axiomatization there are no curves at the moment. You just have the relations and you you give the same names and similar here for causal. And then you also have a a topology automatically, namely you just take these so-called chronological diamonds, so you, you intersect the, the chronological future of a point with the chronological past of another one, and that diamond, these, these diamonds you take as a sub-base of a, of a topology. Okay. So, um, then we can immediately define what a Lorentzian pre-length space is, namely we start out with such a causal space. We also assume it to have a metric, and then we want a function which 
uh, corresponds to the time separation function I showed you before, but now is, is like... No, 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 this is, just, this is just a metric space. And in fact, you could even try to... Um, no, no, but, but there is a metric D, which, which no, is... Uh, under, under mild conditions, but again, you need things like you, you don't want close time-like curves and things like that. So if you have certain causality restrictions, then yes. So, oops, so here I am. Um, okay, so, so here we, we suppose for convenience that we have a metric also, and then we have this time separation function, which we now axiomatically introduce. We say it is uh, a map which is lower semi-continuous. That's a property that the standard time separation function on a space-time always has. Um, and then we want this reverse triangle inequality. So that comes basically from, th this is like uh, an embodiment of the, of the twin paradox in, in relativity. So that, that uh, detours in, in, in a space-time uh, are actually shorter. So, so, um, so the, the triangle inequality goes in the wrong direction. And um, okay, so, so that's, that's the basic uh, spaces that, that uh, we want to look at here. And of course, any smooth space time with the usual time separation function, so the supremum of the length of all uh, future directed causal curves between two points um, is an example of that. But of course, many, many more objects. For example, you can also fit finite directed graphs into that setting. Okay, so, um, so now you, you just have that. So you have the, the two relations, you have the time separation function, and you have a, a background metric that gives you the topology. Uh, and, but of course, you want curves. So the question is, what should causal curves be now? Uh, and what you do is you call a, a non-constant uh, curve, future-directed causal or time-like, if any two points on the curve for, for uh, consecutive times have a causal or a time-like relation. And analogously for null, so you say less or equal, but not less, less. And um, of course, you have to be careful here. So you can, you can construct examples where, where these, uh, these notions would not reproduce the classical notion. So for example, the Lorentz cylinder, when you, when you just take a, a rectangle in, in R2 and you identify the top and the, and the bottom side, then you have closed curves and uh, you, you have time-like relations between any two points. That, that is too, um, um, too wild. But if you have uh, a continuous and strongly causal space-time, then this notion of, of causal curve uh, agrees with the usual one. And, and as I said, so strongly causal is a bit stronger than saying you, you don't have close time-like curves. Um, okay, and then uh, once you have such curves, you can define their length. And now you can, you, you, um, you see that a lot of things here are um, in parallel to what you do in metric geometry, but somehow dual. Because, so if you think of the length of a, of a curve in a metric space, you would do a subdivision and then you would look at the distances of the points in that subdivision and then you would take the supremum of the sum of the lengths. But here now the, the triangle inequality goes in the wrong direction. So now you do the infimum of these, of these sums that you form with the tau and then you check the properties. And that's, okay, this is still additive. It's, it's uh, invariant under reparameterizations and you can then call a curve Somehow this only works from time to time. Um, you call it rectifiable if it has a positive length, and you can then show a rectifiable causal curve is, is time-like. And um, if, you, if you take, so again, you should always check compatibility. So if you have a smooth space-time, which is strongly causal, so no, as, as you would say, no almost closed curves, then uh, the Lorentzian free length space that you get with the usual object. So here you take some um, uh, distance function induced by any um, background Riemannian metric and tau is the usual time separation function. And then this notion of, of length of curves is precisely the, the, the usual one. So the one you get with, with 
uh, the metric. The tall appears now, sorry. No, no, this has nothing to do with, with D. No, no, this is, <laughs> the, 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 this is the primary object we're interested in. The tor now gives you the, 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 the causal structure. The D, yeah, the D, the D gives you a basic topology on your, on your set, and, and you want tor to be semi-continuous. Yes, but, but it would be good if, if it still were um, uh, a metrizable topology because ultimately you will want to, you, yeah, so, the, yeah, okay. The distance is, yeah, you can get rid of that, yeah, but it's, at the moment, I think it's, it's, it's better to, <laughs> to keep it. Um, okay, so uh, then you can, what about geodesics? Well, geodesics now will be, in that setting we are in, maximal causal curves. So, um, so you, and what is a maximal curve? Well, a maximal curve is one that realizes the, well, not distance now, but time separation function. So again, this is dual to the metric uh, uh, geometry setting. You take the time separation function here and you want a curve that is as long as possible. And then null curves are always maximal. Uh, Maximal curves are maximal on any subinterval, and maximal plus time like implies rectifiable. And uh, well, locally maximizing curves are called uh, geodesics. Okay. And then um, uh, one question that is that, that, yeah. Yes, between, between any two points. With distance null. With, with time separate, with, with tall length null. Well, in, 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 in the, in the space-time setting, this is, this is often the case if you have some, some assumptions. So, so here it's it's just that you you look at the is a curve no a null curve is one with where where if you take any two points then the relation between them is less equal but not less less that was our definition of being null related so it's it's all a little bit it's a bit it, Well, you can ask yourself then if you specialize to the space-time setting whether this gives you the same thing. And again, under mild assumption, it does. But for us at the moment, you, you, cannot, you don't have a tangent vector of your curve. And so you say, what does it mean for the curve to be null? And it means you take two points, two consecutive points, and then they are in the less equal relation, but not in the less less relation. So they are causally related, but not time-like related. So that is, yeah. No, this depends. I mean, in. Um, yeah, you cannot. You cannot have. A, you cannot have a curve of positive length between them. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Okay. So here's a here's some some slightly weird example which you can now capture. So what you do is you go into Minkowski space and you take the, the backward causal cone of one point, the forward causal cone of another, and then you just connect them by one curve. And what, what you get out from that, so you just take the union of this, of this curve and of this one, uh, and of, of this, uh, 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 causal future here, that you call a causal funnel. And th now this lambda here is the only way from P to Q. And you just take the, the causality structure which that space inherits from, from two-dimensional Minkowski space, 
And then um, you can have maximizing curves here, which do not have a, a unique causal character. So for example, if, if you make the lambda actually a null curve, then any curve from, from here, from any point here to here, must include a null bit. And that is something that in, uh, in uh, even in low regularity, um, uh, Lorentzian manifolds cannot happen. So for example, if, you, if your metric is at least Lipschitz and you have a maximizing curve in the standard sense, then it must have a causal character. So it must be either everywhere uh, null or everywhere time-like. But here you can, you can play with such things. Um, well, you, you, you just inherit your, your causality structure from Minkowski. So you, you draw this figure in Minkowski. Sorry, and you, you have to say what the relations are. So, so any, any points in here, you have just the standard relation. So a point X here and a point Z here, for example, they are causally related if Z is in the future light cone of the X. But, but here only this, so, so only this region, this curve and this region, they make up your space. It's just these, these, so only only the, the, the black things here. So. Yeah, yeah. And and the wild one, of course, because and, and you also see that that here you will have uh, trouble later on with with uh, synthetic curvature bounds and things like that. So okay, and then you can maybe let me be a bit fast here. You can um, introduce causality notions. So chronological now means you want to, to understand by that that there are no closed uh, um, time-like curves, but you express that in terms of the relation. And you say it's causal, again, um, if less equal is a partial order, so x, x less or equal y and y less or equal x implies x equals y. That, of course, is somehow the axiomatic formulation now of there are no closed causal curves. And then there are other notions like non-totally imprisoning, uh, meaning that a causal curve cannot forever stay in a compact set. And here you see it, that you want, that you have an, an interaction between the d arc length and, and the tau length. So you, that's why you want things like metrizability. And then you can also formulate globally hyper, global hyperbolicity here. So you do that using this non-totally imprisoning condition and the fact that the causal diamonds are compact. So these notions are ordered. So it's more and more special as you go uh, down here. And in under, under mild uh, assumptions, they, they, they have the usual meaning. So you can really express these things in terms of curves. OK, so also here I want to be a little bit faster. Basically, when you, when you do um, Lorentzian causality theory, then um, you, you use the exponential map to have um, uh, normal neighborhoods in which the causality is very easy. So you, you know in a, in, a, in a normal neighborhood, you know that the radial geodesics are the, mag so radial geodesics between uh, causally related points, they are the unique maximizers. And you want something to replace that. And the notion we, we introduced here is localizability. So meaning that you have, you have neighborhoods in your, in your Lorentzian free length space, such that, first of all, um, your, the d length of causal curves that are within that region, they, they can, can only have a certain, they are bounded from above. So meaning that in, in the, in the space-time setting, if you have a causal curve, then it has a certain minimal velocity. And so it has to leave compact sets in a finite time, and its d length cannot be infinite. So that's one thing you want here. And then you want a local time separation function. Um, such that um, you have, um, first of all, maximal uh, future-directed causal curves between two points, so that would somehow um, retain the property of, of the, the maximizing property of radial geodesics, and that should be expressible in this continuous function in, in here, which is, so you have a local time separation function, which is better, not just semi-continuous, it is continuous, uh, and gives you the length. And in addition, you can, you can uh, uh, impose that you want that if you, if you have time-like related 
points, then this maximal curve is also strictly longer than any other future-directed causal curve um, connecting them. Okay, so that, that's uh, the localizability uh, notion. And as I said, that this is somehow to retain something like you have nice uh, causality in, in neighborhoods, which you would automatically get in the space-time setting by using normal coordinates. Okay, so and now we can say what a Lorentzian length space is, and that is again very completely analogous and dual to the to the notion of a of a metric length space. So for a metric length space, you you take a metric space, then you say what the length of curves is by doing a subdivision, summing the distances, and then taking the supremum, and that gives you a length metric. And if that length metric is the original metric, then you call it a length space. And here you do this the the analogous thing. So you take your pre-length space, you add some conditions, so like, for example, this localizability, and in addition, you say that if you define now uh, a notion that is completely analogous to how you define the time separation function in the, in the manifold setting, namely, you take the supremum now of the tall length we had defined uh, of, of all future-directed causal curves between the points, um, and then... Um, you say that your space is a length space if that gives you back the original time separation function. So you do the same thing as in the metric setting, just with the directions reversed. So now you take the supremum of these lengths here, and you want that the procedure closes off immediately, you go back to the original time separation function. Okay, and then uh, what you get is, so first of all, um, if, you, if you have a smooth and strongly causal space time, then um, your, your, uh, if you view it as a, as a Lorentzian pre-length space with, with the notions we had before, then you get a regular Lorentzian length space. And in fact, this is true much more generally. So it is true for continuous uh, Lorentzian metrics, which have a causality properties, so strongly causal and causally plain. So that is something that, that has only appeared a few years ago. Um, when, you, when you have Lorentzian metrics that are uh, continuous, but not Lipschitz continuous, then you can have very uh, pathological uh, effects of the causality. So for example, there are, there are uh, Hölder metrics which have uh, light cones where the, where the boundary of the light cone has infinite measure. So this is the same effect you have in, in ODE theory when you, when you have non-uniqueness of solutions. So you have a point here, and all of these points here are on the boundary of the light cone. So, so all of this, this entire region would be um, the boundary of your light cone. And that, of course, is, is very unwanted and uh, also does not fit in this setting here because... Uh, here, for example, the, the time separation function will not be lower semi-continuous. But if you exclude that, so certainly for, for any Lipschitz Lorentzian uh, metric, you, you are precisely in that setting. You always get a Lorentzian length space. Less than C11. This is much less than C11, but, but there are certain continuous um, space times which we do not capture here. So, namely, the ones between continuous and Lipschitz, they make these problems, and, and this completely screws up your causality theory, and maybe you don't even want that. But okay. Um, okay, so now, uh, what about triangles? Of course, now that you have this setting, you can, again, look into, into metric geometry. How do you handle um, uh, curvature? Well, first of all, you define, now you have to take care of the uh, causal character as well. You define time like geodesic triangles. Well, these are just three points which, have, which are in this time-like relation and have finite distance, so time separation. Uh, and you uh, assume that the sides are realized by causal curves. And um, yeah, so that is, I think, quite clear. And then what you want to do is you want to do um, a comparison. So you want to, to formulate kind of a, Toponogov uh, property, where you look at your geodesic triangle and you, you compare with a Lorentzian uh, model space, and then you, you uh, formulate curvature bounds by uh, 
comparing the, the time separation function here, for example, of this point with a point here, with uh, the time separation in the model space. And the model spaces are um, basically just so um, De Sitter, Minkowski, and anti De Sitter space. Well, they are actually the simply connected covering manifolds, but, but basically it's that. And uh, you can also show this, this was done uh, a while ago by Harris, Alexander, and Bishop. So for small time like triangles, you always have up to isometry unique comparison triangles. And then you can formulate your, your curvature bounds just like in the metric setting. So you have to say a little bit more. So if you want, for example, time like curvature bounded below, um, then you want for, by some K in R, then you want to have neighborhoods where, first of all, the time separation function restricted to the small neighborhood is finite and continuous. Um, you want that for any two time-like related points, you can find the maximal causal curve between them, and then you do the, the, the triangle comparison as I, as I just uh, said. So um, you compare with the, the time separation function in your model space. And um, as, as I showed you at the very beginning, this result by Alexander and Bishop shows that this really captures in the, in the space-time setting, this really is, is equivalent to having sectional curvature bounds um, in, in, um, well, in, the, in the standard setting. Mm -hmm. No, because I mean, in well, I mean, also here you impose that somehow. Of course, in the in the model spaces, everything is is is, is oh, iso. Ah, so yes, that's that. Yes, yes. So they are really they are really uh, up to. I think that I, I had this. This this really only only works sometimes. So here, um, so there is a unique up to isometry oh, yes. time like triangle in the model space. Oh, right. Yeah, it, it is interesting that this was actually shown rather late, <laughs> but it's it's not it's not uh, it's not because it's super difficult. It's no, well, yeah. I mean, you need to know you need to understand the geometry of the theta and anti theta, but it's not that it's not that bad. Yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm trying always. You, you don't see that, but I press all the time. <laughs> um, so let me go back. <laughs> so here it was for a moment. Where, where are my spaces? So what, well, you, you, you have your time-like triangle. So now you have to really take care that this is time-like related to this, this is time-like related to this. Then you take a point here, and you, you have your, your up to isometry. You have a unique triangle here. Yeah. The curvature bounds, yeah. So th this was this toponograph I showed you in the beginning for semi-Riemannian manifolds. So the, the time-like bounds you, you get here, they correspond to, to, to time-like sectional curvature bounds in the, in the sense of, of when, you, when you measure it with the signed length. Time-like, yes. Well, of signature one, well, yeah, one, one, yes. Yes. Okay, so now you can say what a curvature singularity is, and that, that's interesting because it, it immediately tells you that you, you can say that you, that you can apply this to, to uh, space time. So uh, you say that, that your Lorentzian pre length space has a time like or causal curvature uh, singularity or curvature unbounded below or above. If there exists a point, there exists a neighborhood like in these comparison assumptions, towards finite and continuous. 
and maximal timeline causal curves exists, but triangle comparison fails for every k. Then you can say that x has a curvature singularity, and now you can actually test that. So for example, here is uh, a plot of some uh, geodesics of, of the inner Schwarzschild solution of, of, of relativity. And then you see that, uh, so you, here you have these infalling geodesics to the, to the uh, singularity here. And if you, if you take these triangles here, th these ones, you see that they become more and more caustic here. And then uh, you can actually see by triangle comparison that there must be a, a singularity there. Of course, that's not a new thing. I mean, there are, there are curvature scalars that, that explode here, but it's nice that you can check it really with, with this uh, triangle notion. Okay. So uh, here's another example, which was done by, by some of our PhD students, Agam back there. And <laughs> um, so um, in general, uh, splitting theorems are rigidity results um, that tell you that if you have, and so they, they are kind of a criterion whether your your notion of, of, of geometry uh, describes the relationship between curvature and distance relation in a satisfying way. So basically, if you have a complete space and you have a curvature greater or equal zero and you have a global distance realizing curve, so a line, then your space should split. And one can actually show that if you have a sufficiently nice, in a certain sense, globally hyperbolic Lorentzian length space, which has global time like curvature greater or equal zero, and there exists a time-like line, so a, a, a maximize a distance realizer that is time-like and exists for all times, then there exists a homeomorphism from the space into R times S. That homeomorphism preserves the time-like, the causal relation, and the time separation function, and the S is a proper and geodesic metric space of Alexandrov curvature greater or equal zero. So that is very satisfying because this shows that somehow it, it, it really gives you back in that, in that framework uh, what you would expect from a splitting theorem uh, of space times. Okay, so here is some, some more things that have been done. So first of all, the lower uh, time like curvature bounds, they imply non-branching. So this is again very similar to the metric setting, uh, kind of uh, surprising to us, but very uh, nice, a, a, a good surprise was that upper sectional curvature bounds imply push up of curves. And push up of curves is again something that you want in, in relativity. So if you have, um, this basically means that if you, if you have uh, x less or equal y less less z, so meaning you can go from x to y along some causal curve, which might be null, and then from y to z with some time-like curve, then also you have that x is less less z. And, that, and if you formulate that in terms of curves, um, then um, we, we can show that upper sectional curvature uh, bounds imply that you can really do that. Then you can look at inextendability of space times and, and, and curvature blow up, and that is kind of a hot topic um, because you want to see that if your space time is inextendable, then there is a reason for that. So in particular, if you, if you can show that your space time cannot be extended, for example, as a, as a continuous space time, or let's say as a Lipschitz space time, then you want that maybe some curvature explodes. And here we have a setting where you can prove such results so that you see that um, if, you, um, if you have inextendability, then this is due to a curvature blow up in, the, in this, in this uh, setting of, of synthetic um, sectional curvature bounds. Okay, so other things that have been studied are generalized cones, these are warped products. You can look at time functions, gluing. Then for these, for these curvature, for these sectional curvature bounds, you can uh, give many equivalent formulations. In particular, you can formulate it in terms of angles, where angles here are hyperbolic angles. Um, and there are lots of equivalent formulations. You have hinge uh, comparison, you have monotonicity comparison, there is four-point comparison, and there are also um, um, characterizations in terms of, of convexity of the, 
time separation function. And surprising to us, <laughs> oops, there was even a paper where they used these spaces in machine learning for something which I did not study further. Okay, so now I want to, I want to switch for the last 10 minutes to, um, to Ricci curvature. So, so far, I was only telling you about sectional curvature, but um, if, you, if you first let's look at the Riemannian case, if you want to, uh, to have a synthetic approach to Ricci curvature, then you could say, okay, Ricci is an average of sectional curvature, and in a way, it controls how volumes um, um, change under, under geodesic flow. And so if you want to characterize Ricci in some synthetic way, then you, you would, should look at volume distortion. So um, volume you would measure by the, by the usual uh, Riemannian volume element. And the suitable synthetic setting then would be that you look at metric measure spaces. So you have a space X, a metric D, and some reference measure M. Um, and for, for having uh, Ricci bounds, you would then replace basically point geometry with volume geometry. And you do that in terms of probability measures and use optimal transport. So there is this, this theory. Um, so of, of Sturm, Lott, and Villani. So let's first introduce some. <sighs> okay, well, yeah, okay. So what's, what's the setup? You have some separable complete metric space. Uh, you look at the Borel probability measures on, on X, and then the problem is how do you transport some measure, which you can think of as, I don't know, a pile of sand or something, to some other measure, so some mu in P of X to nu in P of X, and you define pi of mu nu, so these are measures now on, on the Cartesian product of X with itself, whose marginals are these mu and nu respectively. And then you can in, introduce the, the P Wasserstein distance, which you define like this. So you integrate the, the Pth power of the distance over this, uh, over this measure pi, with, so which, I, which is in this set here, so has the correct marginals. And well, you do kind of an LP norm here. This is a metric space and inherits lots of properties from, from your space X. And you can now study geodesics between probability measures, because you have this, this distance here. And that's the, the theory of, of Lord Sturm and Villani. So you, you again have a metric measure space. XD is complete and separable. Geodesic M is a Radon measure on X. And then you look at entropy functionals. So you, you assign to probability measures uh, some number, and um, you only have uh, something that is, that is uh, not infinity if uh, you, you have a, a measure that is absolutely continuous with respect to the reference measure. And so if you can write your measure in this form rho times m, then the entropy of your measure is this integral here. So here you see this typical entropy term rho times log rho. Uh, you integrate that. And then you say that uh, x has a Ricci bounded below by 0 if for all mu nu in this um, uh, Wasserstein space of, of probability measures, uh, for any two such, you want a, a geodesic such that you have this uh, convexity condition on this entropy functional. So entropy of mu t is less or equal entropy, 1 minus t entropy of, mu, of the first one time pl plus t times entropy of the second one. And uh, that is actually equivalent to, to, this, to this Ricci bound. Um, and of course, you can do other bounds. Things get more and more technical, but uh, lower bounds of, for other numbers are also possible. And you can even find conditions that at the same time also encode an upper bound on the, on the dimension. Uh, sorry. Uh, yes, sorry. Yeah, this should be mu zero, mu one, yes. So now you can, you can, um, do that, you can play that game in this, in this new Lorentzian setting. So now you take a Lorentzian pre-length space and you add a reference measure, a Radon measure, and now you look at Lorentzian optimal transport. The main difference being now, you have to take into account the, the causal structure. So you want to 
um, have, you, you only want to do your transport with measures that give a full measure to the space of points that are um, chronologically related. So, um, and you also now look at, so you, here you have the, 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 the new distance now, so things are different because the P now is not greater than one, but between zero and one, and you replace the distance here with the time separation function, but other than that, it looks uh, uh, completely analogous, and you call two measures time like P dualizable if there is an optimal pi in this, in this set here of, uh, of measures that give full measure to the chronologically related points. Uh, no, because, because not, yeah, yeah, it, yeah, mm -hmm, yes. Okay, so here you have um, sy synthetic time like Ricci curvature bounds. So X satisfies the time like curvature dimension condition with P and, and bound K and dimension N here if for all mu zero, mu one, which are time like P dualizable, so you, there exist such geodesics, the geodesics then automatically are always absolutely continuous. And then you have again, so don't, don't look at the details too closely, again you have a convexity notion here, where these are some universal uh, coefficient functions that, that come from basically the, the um, solutions with equality of your, of your uh, entropy equations. So they, they contain sine and, and, and or sine hyperbolic and things like that. So anyways, you can express a time like curvature bounds in terms of convexity of some entropy functional. And again, in the smooth setting, the TCDK dimension M uh, condition holds if and only if the Ricci uh, curvature uh, is greater or equal K in time-like directions. So the causality always have to, has to be taken into account here. And then you can retrieve many uh, or retain many classical results that are derived from, from time like Ricci bounds, um, you can get from that condition like Bonnet Myers and Bishop Gromov and so on. And maybe one final thing. So here is a, here is a very uh, nice recent application. So this is a synthetic Hawking singularity theorem. So you take X to be a nice globally hyperbolic measured Lorentzian length space satisfying uh, an energy condition in the sense that you have this Ricci curvature bounded below by zero. Now you take some subset which, which um, corresponds to a space-like hypersurface in the space-time setting. Uh, FTC means future time-like complete. Basically, this is, a, this is an abstraction of what a Cauchy uh, hypersurface would be in the space-time setting. And uh, if you have then uh, synthetic future mean curvature bound, which now you, again, you need some, some th synthetic um, way of expressing that, and you do that by variation of the area, so that you can still formulate in that setting, and in the, in the smooth setting, this is the same as having a mean curvature bound. And if you impose these synthetic conditions, then you get a maximal existence time for any uh, future time like maximizing curve emanating from that. So that's precisely uh, what, the, what the Hawking singularity <coughs> theorem tells you. And if you specialize it to the smooth setting, <coughs> let me finish that. So in the smooth setting and actually even down to the C1 setting where this has been proved by, by Melanie Graf in, in uh, 2020, this really genera generalizes the Hawking theorem. So this is really uh, very uh, nice to have, and then maybe some further developments. So first of all, there is a, an axiomatization in this setting of, of, the, of the vacuum Einstein equations. So for that, you also need something like upper Ricci curvature bounds, and basically you say, um, you want to, to, to say that um, Ricci curvature is zero if it's bounded below and above by zero, and then you have a formulation of the Einstein equations. There is an, a Lorentzian analog of Hausdorff dimension at measure. Now you take, instead of balls, you take causal diamonds. This would be the, the sets that also take into account the causality structure. And, and uh, another topic that is very, um, very uh, prominent at the moment is 
to have a good notion of, of uh, convergence for these spaces. And that, of course, is, is, is non-trivial because um, the, the, the compactness somehow is missing here. So, but there are already uh, some, some approaches to that. One is bounded Lorentzian metric spaces, which, um, which automatically are <laughs> compact and for which you really do have a good notion of gromov hausdorff uh, convergence. And, and also a, a, a chrome of pre-compactness result. Um, so this is, this is under investigation at the moment. And here are some references, and thank you very much. <laughs>